Good morning. I'm Bethany Morgan. I think I know most of you. Um, and I work mostly in the hospital setting. I kind of wanted to focus on, uh, you know, we the emergency situations we encounter day to day are status epilepticus. Um, I think that's the most common neurologic emergency in kids, but uh, some of these things we don't see so often, uh, including demyelinating disease. Um, we see it occasionally, but I think sometimes we're ill-prepared for some of the emergency complications, so that's what I want to talk about today. So as far as things that I want to cover today, uh, reviewing emergency manage management of non-infectious inflammatory demyelinating diseases in kids, and early identification, how to identify kids at risk for acute decompensation. So I'll start out by talking about some of the emergency complications that I, that I can readily identify. Status epilepticus, of course, and then compromise of respiratory drive, either inability to protect the airway due to mental status or clear secretions, or respiratory insufficiency due to respiratory muscle weakness, or the respiratory control centers in the brainstem. Um, one of the rare complications um, is uh, neurogenic pulmonary edema um, that personally I've not seen. Increased intracranial pressure obviously is concerning. Dysautonomia is fairly common with um, some of the demyelinating disorders, including cardiac arrhythmias and blood pressure lability. Given the common uh, occurrence of dysautonomia, of course, you can have a posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or press, um, and we'll cover all those. So I think the one demyelinating disease that we see on a relatively regular basis in kids um, is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. The diagnostic criteria, one of the key parts of the diagnostic criteria is that as a polyfocal um, CNFS event, meaning there are multiple areas, and also that the child is encephalopathic or has some alteration in mental status that is, can be a broad spectrum, and that can't be explained by fever or postictal state. There are no clinical or MRI findings three months after the acute onset, and during the acute phase, the brain MRI usually shows diffuse, poorly demarcated, poorly circumscribed, large lesions, um, involving predominantly the white matter, but sometimes free matter. There's usually a history of infection within the preceding couple of weeks, mean age five to eight years, and the presenting symptoms, as I said, the spectrum of encephalopathy ranging from just a little bit of drowsiness or behavior changes to coma. Motor dysfunction is fairly common as well. Ataxia, vision loss, Seizures are relatively common presentation, including prolonged seizures or status epilepticus. So the um, parts of this that I want to emphasize, obviously the encephalopathy, the potential for uh, respiratory compromise, and then the possibility for seizures and status epilepticus and to treat that. There are some variants of ADEM that have a generally poor prognosis. Um, and you can see them there, I won't read them all to you. And one series of all the patients with ADEM, about 2% had one of these variants. These are usually very large lesions, um, very uh, tremendous amount of edema around the lesions, and that leads to mass effect. And uh, it's high mortality rate with um, these variants. So obviously emergency management and identification is important. So laboratory findings in ADEM, um, you can't have pleo CSF pleocytosis. Usually anything beyond 50 white cells in a non-traumatic tap is less suggestive of ADEM, but it can happen. Sometimes elevated CSF protein, and usually there's a cutoff there. And um, kids with ADEM usually don't have unpaired CSF oligoclonal bands. That's more suggestive of uh, a relapsing disorder, something like multiple sclerosis. And 
there are no tests on the CSF that are suggestive of infection, including cultures or PCRs. So as I mentioned, the neuroimaging in ADEM, they're very large, poorly circumscribed lesions. I've heard them described as fluffy lesions, um, as opposed to the very ovoid lesions with something like multiple sclerosis. And um, of course you can see here that mainly the white matter involved and bilateral, but diffuse. So again, um, re-emphasizing the neuroimaging findings, but you can also get some, some gray involvement, as I said. And the follow-up MRI three months out from the acute insult should show pretty much complete resolution of the lesions. So what's the emergency part of what we might encounter with ADEM? Of course, I said status epilepticus, encephalopathy, monitoring airway. And then also, if there's a lot of perilesional edema, you can have increased intracranial um, pressure or hypertension. So looking for optic disc edema and measuring the CSF opening pressure um, is important. So treatment of status epilepticus associated with ADEM is not really any different from um, what you would normally do for status epilepticus related to other causes. Generally support airway, um, breathing circulation, first line benzodiazepines. Um, and then if uh, the benzodiazepines, uh, the second line or the second dose of benzodiazepine are given, then probably one of the second line medications, phosphonatoin or levetiracetam. So ADEM actually will resolve without any treatment. Um, the goal really here is to hasten recovery. Um, there are probably some situations on a case-by-case -case basis where um, symptomatic and supportive care is probably okay, but we generally do treat with high-dose IV steroids for three to five days. And um, I think there's some um, regarding oral steroid taper with the myelin eating disease. A lot of people don't do it, but I've generally seen it um, accepted as a part of ADEM treatment. If there's a poor response to high-dose high IV steroids, then plasma exchange or IVIG might be considered. So complete recovery is the general rule, uh, low mortality rate. However, the duration of recovery can be quite long. Um, the most cognitive, most, <laughs> the most common residual deficit is um, cognitive problems. So follow-up neuropsych testing would be important. So I have a case here of a 12-year-old girl, no significant past medical history, comes in by ambulance. She reports a progressive heaviness in her lower extremities. She first noticed it when she was trying to get on the school bus in the morning. By the time she arrived at school, she had to have two to three friends help her to get to the nurse's office. They were basically carrying her. When she tried to get into her mother's car to go to the ER, she did fall and then um, EMS was called to transport her by ambulance. So on our exam, about four hours from the time she felt the heaviness in her legs when she was getting on the bus, Strength in, her both, in both lower extremities, one out of five, and upper extremities, four out of five. She was a reflexic in the bilateral lower extremities. Um, reflexes were pretty normal in the both upper extremities. She had a sensory level at about T4, and she reported stretching sensation when she took a deep breath in and feeling like she was wearing a seatbelt across her chest. She did have some mild weakness of neck extension. So her chest X-ray, hypoinflation bilaterally. She did have an initial uh, negative inspiratory force, and if uh, was normal at 40. So what's, what are the first things you're concerned about, and what is your differential diagnosis here? What are your highest suspicions? Do we have any residents? Crickets. Okay. 
Can you so, go back to the case page, please? I'm sorry? Will you go back to the case page, the mm -hmm. just the one slide back, please? Yes. So, bilateral lower extremity weakness with areflexia. I'm sorry? Guillain-Barre syndrome? That would definitely be in the differential diagnosis, yes. Anything else you would put in there? have a spinal cord injury yes, as is so, mm -hmm. spinal cord injury compression absolutely myelitis i don't know if that covers mm -hmm. gbs but yeah. yes absolutely i think those are the three main things that i would include in the differential so first things first she had hypoinflation on her chest x-ray she had a little bit mild weakness of neck extension. You want her in a place where you can monitor her closely and control uh, her respiratory status if necessary. So she went to the PICU. She was placed on telemetry. Obviously, thinking about the common occurrence of dysautonomia. She did electively get intubated about six hours after the symptom onset, so it was a pretty uh, quick progression to nadir symptoms. She did have some urinary retention, so her bladder was she compressed with the Foley catheter. Then, of course, like we talked about in our differential diagnosis, we want to rule out a compressive lesion, and we did so. So the MRI of the brain and cervical cord were normal. On the MRI thoracic cord, she had T2 hyperintensity throughout the cord from T2 to T9. There's no enhancement. Her CSF exam was essentially normal. So this young lady had acute transverse myelitis. Um, we excluded the other possible causes to best of our ability. So the transverse re refers to the typical band-like sensation that this particular patient had like the seat belt across the chest, um, as well as the feeling that she was uh, being squeezed um, when she inhaled and the sensory level at T4. So, like as I said, the diagnosis of exclusion. Um, so MRI, anyone who comes in with symptoms related to referral to the cord, they definitely need the um, compressive etiology excluded. So regarding diagnostic criteria, this is generally for adults. So we attribute the deficits to the spinal cord. Symptoms are usually bilateral. The sensory level, uh, as we said in this particular case at T4, we excluded compressive etiology. And um, with adults, the presence of uh, legal clonal bands or elevated IgG index or contrast enhancement is uh, part of the diagnostic criteria. And then the progression to the nadir of symptoms can be pretty quick as it was in this young lady, four hours to 21 days. And um, most of the time, the rapid progression of symptoms leads to, uh, or is reported to be a worse outcome, but not always. In children, acute transfer myelitis might present a little bit differently because they may not be able to fully describe symptoms, back pain, sensory loss, usually in the thoracic level, urinary dysfunction, severe constipation. And as with the example, a sort of a spinal shock picture is possible early where there is a reflexia and uh, flaccid paralysis. And we obviously would have to exclude Guillain-Barre syndrome. So some things to think about with suspected uh, ATM. So this was a longitudinally extensive transfer myelitis over three vertebral segments. So we'd want to consider the possibility of a relapsing disorder like 
neuromyelitis optica. And I'm not gonna go through these diagnostic characteristics, but um, for the residents, uh, these, you, you should know these, you will need to know these probably for your boards um, in the right exam. And the reference for this is um, for these diagnostic criteria here. You should wanna look those up. So other special considerations. So uh, there is this nasty thing called acute flaccid myelitis. And I did say that I was going to talk about non-infectious inflammatory disorders, but I think this deserves a mention when we're talking about uh, transverse myelitis at least idiopathic acute transverse myelitis. So acute flaccid myelitis um, is a little bit different as far as what parts of the cord are affected. They're usually isolated. The inflammation is usually in, isolated to the anterior horn cells um, with posterior columns spared. So almost mimicking like an uh, anterior spinal infarct. So the incidence is actually, depends on the year of course, is a little bit higher than acute transverse myelitis, which I found sort of surprising. Um, the pathophysiology is different, which has direct influ influence on treatment, and we'll get to that. So the thought is that motor neurons are being directly affected with this neuroinvasive enterovirus. Um, those have been identified as the causative agents. Whereas acute transverse myelitis, the idiopathic form, is thought to be an antibody-mediated disease. So some of the things suggestive uh, in trying to differentiate between ATM and AFM, with AFM, asymmetric onset flaccid limb weakness is usually uh, is pretty typical in one arm. Pain or paresthesia in the affected limb uh, without any clear sensory problems. And bowel and bladder dysfunction is less common in AFM than it is in acute uh, transverse myelitis. So why does it matter differentiating between the two? Because it seems like we treat everything with steroids, right? So AFM is actually a reportable illness and the CDC is tracking this. Um, the treatment of AFM differs slightly in that we use caution with steroids. If there's a, uh, it's associated with enteroviruses A71, there are some reports that outcomes might be worse and there might be increased mortality if this virus is present. So early testing for a respiratory pathogen is recommended. There are two vaccines available in China for this particular strain of enterovirus, but they are not available to my knowledge in the United and I do not believe there is a vaccine available for the other enterovirus associated with AFM. The other thing with AFM, if we suspect it, um, time is of the essence because early treatment, um, we think the outcome is better. And early treatment with IVIG is uh, kind of the accepted first line. So neuroimaging. As you can see on this, mainly the anterior part of the spinal cord is affected um, also here. Then idiopathic or acute transverse myelitis, you can see that it's more diffuse in the cord, as well as on the axial. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison to hopefully give you a visual of what the difference looks like. There's more of this straight line down the anterior cord, whereas this more swollen polar cord involvement with transverse myelitis, acute transverse myelitis. So going back to uh, transverse myelitis, of course, I alluded to the treatment of high dose IV um, steroids are the accepted treatment. We think that it hastens recovery, improves outcomes, and then um, Considering an oral prednisone taper, not everyone does this after IV steroids. If there's an incomplete response to IV steroids, of course we consider the second line treatments, plasma exchange, and also IVIG. Rehabilitation early is very important. 
So moving a little bit away from the central nervous system to demyelination in the peripheral nervous system, we mentioned in our differential diagnosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome. So I'm just going to really refer to the bulk of cases, which is the AIDP, which is about 90%, because I believe Dr. Rogers spoke about the other forms in her grandmas a couple weeks ago. So lifetime risks, one in a thousand can be vaccine associated. Um, so required features that you have to have for diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Progressive, usually ascending muscle weakness of more than one limb, and then areflexia or hyporeflexia. Things that are supportive of the diagnosis, progression of weakness over a two to four week period, as I said, symmetry. There can be some mild sensory symptoms, and that might actually, in younger kids, um, I found that it might be a little bit more prominent and, and something that you pick up on earlier than actually the weakness because the weakness might be a little more subtle. Cranial nerve involvement. Autonomic dysfunction, again, that would be something you would want to urgently monitor for and manage. Generally, no fever. And then elevated, elevated protein or the albuminocytologic dissociation. And recovery is generally two to four weeks, perhaps a little bit longer than that. So about a third of patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome will require mechanical ventilation, intubation of mechanical ventilation at some point. I think there's always a um, confusion as to why do we look at the CSF? Why do we do CSF analysis? Um, well, if you think about the AFM, if you think about um, other um, uh, polio viruses back in the day, um, you have to exclude those in your differential. So we're lo really looking for infection. GBS cell count's usually normal. And then I mentioned that we have this elevated protein that's pretty typical. Early in the course, it can be normal though. So clinical care, um, depending on where they are in the course of the illness, I see monitoring is a good idea um, if they have not reached nadir of symptoms. Monitoring forced vital capacity and NIFs in kids who are able to do that for any deter deterioration in respiratory status. And then as far as treatment, um, generally accepted for IVIG or flex. And um, one thing that is, I don't know how commonly this is used in adults, but it's kind of fun to play with online, is this Erasmus GBS Respiratory Insufficiency Score. And here's the website here. It kind of tells you a prognosis of who is at risk for deterioration. So I thought that was kind of a good resource. So again, um, keep em emphasizing dysautonomia. And I think the importance of IC monitoring, so low blood pressure, headache, um, cardiac arrhythmias are possible. So important to avoid triggers of the dysautonomia. So decompressing the bladder, decompressing the bowels, managing any spasticity, elevating the head of the bed, and sometimes uh, medications are. So rare complications of demyelinating disease. Neurogenic pulmonary edema, which I personally have not seen and I hope I don't. So medullary lesions, um, this is usually associated with and with uh, more of a brainstem type syndrome. So with the dysautonomia comes the risk of press. Um, there is an association of press with NMO that is thought to be related to down regulation of the aquaphor and four water channels. Um, clinical seizures, again, seizures, encephalopathy, headache, visual disturbance, even cortical blindness. So, obviously, we'll want to address hypertension um, or dysautonomia if it's present. And then it's just supportive care and sometimes corticosteroids. So, rarely we do have um, large enough lesions 
um, such as an ADEM or MS variants to increase intracranial pressure and cause mass effect. So I'm not going to go into those MS variants. I'm going to leave those for Dr. Sweeney some other time. Um, Tumefactive and uh, MS and um, Bela's concentric sclerosis, but they have Tumefactive MS is sometimes difficult to prove without a biopsy. Bela's concentric sclerosis generally has a characteristic uh, radiologic appearance. So um, you manage the increased intracranial pressure just as you would for other causes. So elevating head of the bed, um, permissive hypertension if it's present, hyperventilating, osmotic agents like mannitol or hypertonic saline, and then Rarely, uh, neurosurgical event intervention is um, the last life-saving measures, and there are other, you know, neurosurgical interventions that are beyond the scope of my practice. So, so the main emergency complications of demyelinating disease that we talked about: seizures, respiratory insufficiency or failure, increased intracranial pressure, dysautonomia, sometimes associated with press. So, status epilepticus, think of ADEM, if that could be the first manifestation. Manage a group protocol like you would um, status epilepticus for other. With ADEM, long term antiepileptic medications are generally not necessary, but maybe in three months when the disease is active. So, compromise of respiratory drive, a lot of different demyelinating conditions in a lot of different places can cause compromised respiratory effort. So diffuse processes like ADEM, brainstem lesions where we are interfering with the control centers, and then high cervical cord lesions or polyradiculopathy where we get respiratory muscle weakness. Increased intracranial pressure, large lesions, demyelinating lesions. So ADEM and variants of MS, Treat as you would uh, IC, increased ICP due to a mass lesion. Dysautonomia, avoiding triggers is really important. And then doing these all these supportive measures and treating the underlying illness. So I hope that um, you'll be um, ready to identify these emergencies and involve our ICU friends very early um, for management of these patients, recognize some of the symptoms, and then also be able to look for the kids who are at risk for acute decomposition and have them in the right place for um, us to intervene quickly um, and support them in the way they need. So, I, hope, I think I have some time left, so that's not a bad thing, right? So, take any questions? No, that was a lot of repetition, but um, it's part of learning, right? So, uh, hi, Beth. Uh, that was a very hi. nice talk. Um, can you um, uh, tell us some of the exclusionary criteria for GBS and and some things that can and the other question is uh, maybe give us some uh, you know pointers on how one might distinguish clinically between um, you know GBS and a patient with ADM that comes in early and that looks like they may be in spinal shock how would you make that distinction clinically um, it's tough um... So I think for um, GBS, symmetry is probably key in the clinical history, usually of ascending weakness. Um, transverse myelitis doesn't have to have that history of ascending weakness. And um, obviously, transverse myelitis, you're going to have more sensory involvement generally. So ascending weakness, clinical history is more consistent with GBS. Also, motor, not so much sensory involvement, is consistent with GBS, whereas transverse myelitis, usually a sensory level, a dermatome in the thoracic um, levels, and sensory involvement. 
and um, I feel like some what I've seen, the cases I've seen, GBS is a little bit more slowly, it has a little bit more indolent course. Either can be quick, but I feel like that acute um, worsening over hours is more consistent with transverse myelitis, but that's just anecdotal. So it's tough without imaging, but we always want to do MRI imaging of the cord when we come up with um, symptoms referable to the cord, especially areflexia, um, hyporeflexia, to rule out cord compression. Hope that answers your question. Those are the, some of the things that I think of. Um, when we have the spinal shock picture with transverse myelitis, it's hard to, to tease out without imaging and CSF analysis. Yeah. And also some of the, uh, I don't know, uh, exclusionary criteria for GBS. Um, I believe asymmetry and um, hyperreflexia might be. Um, as also um, an elevated cell count in the CSF would probably um, put you more in the category of something else, probably infectious. Hmm. Yeah, so I think more than 50 cells in the CSF. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, a sensory level also would you know, speak against TBS also. And as far as, um, you know, really any um, inflammatory demyelinating disorder, I think 50 cells, white cells in the CSF is kind of the accepted cutoff for when we consider, you know, uh, is this really idiopathic, inflammatory, or post-infectious? So not just for GBS, but also for things like ADEM and uh, transverse myelitis. And uh, Beth, um, how often might you just see headaches in a patient with ADEM uh, acutely without any other focal neurological symptoms and things like that? So I think the key there is that if the patient isn't encephalopathic, then that leans away toward the diagnosis. That's one of the key diagnostic points for diagnosing ADEM. So without that and without any kind of signs of encephalopathy, I would look for other causes, although you have to think about where they might be in their disease progression too. So um, I have not seen patients present with solely Headache alone. Um, you know, the other thing is, if they the ones I've seen that have presented with headache, um, you know, we're talking about probably increased um, intracranial pressure. So, what's their vision like? Um, you know, do they have optic disc edema? Um, and that's, um, you know, with headache, I, I would probably expect that that as well. But encephalopathy would be something to is kind of it hinges that diagnosis hinges on that. And the other thing, the other polyfocal thing, um, they don't have any other, um, they don't meet that criteria too. So encephalopathy, polyfocal, um, just with headache, um, unless you can prove polyfocal by imaging, then you consider other diagnoses. Thank you. Anything else? So, okay. Beth, mm -hmm. uh, do you have an, uh, you know, what is your sense, what is your experience, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, you said once you have somebody with ADEM that fails steroids, right? Um, I guess the question I have for you is that, you know, sometimes in those patients, especially if they are very sick, uh, you know, there is a uh, time issue, you know, where you are trying to uh, make a decision about certain things. And um, so do you have a sense of whether IVIG, you know, or Plex is a better option when, when you have failed steroids, 
And especially if the patient is quite ill, actually, um, you yes. know, because their time does make a difference. And so where you can't just say, oh, we'll try IVIG and then if it, you know, fails, mm -hmm. then we'll go to Plex. I mean, do you have a sense of what you might prefer in ADEM specifically in terms of IVIG or Plex? Right. So I, I tend to gravitate toward Plex because I feel like if I'm IVIG, as you said, does take a while. Um, and I feel that there's a quicker response to Plex. In addition, IVIG is quite expensive. And if you turn around and you don't get much of a clinical improvement with IVIG, and then you turn around and decide to do Plex anyway, then you're losing the effect of the IVIG because it's just going to be extracted by the Plex. So, um, that, that's my typical approach. Now, of course, with Plex, you have to consider the size of the patient. Um, so, so that plays into that decision, but I, I tend to use more Plex first before IVIG. Yeah, so, and, and the reason I asked that question is because we ran into this predicament, you know, with a patient about two years back. It was a toddler and, um, and he had very significant bulbar dysfunction and uh, and in fact they were getting to a point where they were talking about tracking the kid and things like that and i was like hang on a second you know and uh, and so i just we decided to flex the child and uh, the child had a really very dramatic improvement and it totally changed the course of everything for that child and mm -hmm. so i i i tend to agree with you that uh, you know, that Plex may be a better way to go in that subset of patients sometimes, uh, you know, rather than just saying, we'll just give you IVIG. I think if a patient is stable on the floor and, you know, and then you do sort of IVIG and things like that, I think mm -hmm. it may be okay if, you know, if you feel like you have the luxury of time. But sometimes if that is not the case, I, I, I tend to think that, uh, the Plex option uh, may be the way to go. And some of the you know other places that I've worked, getting a line um, for Plex is a barrier. Um, so far here, it hasn't been. Oh no, over um, here you will. It is uh, uh, any time, a day, yeah. night. You can get a Plex line here. They, that's never going to be an issue ever. So yeah. So I mean, I think if the patient's critically ill, you know, the other factor is. Um, are they alert enough to pull a line out? Um, so you have to think about that. But if they're alert enough to pull a line out. I would, I probably, I would tend to agree with you. You know, they're they're probably stable enough for the floor and uh, stable enough to do IVIG as a second line instead of doing Plex. But I tend to prefer in those situations. I tend to go with Plex first. And also, the other question I have in regards to, uh, let's look at this more from an adult standpoint. So let's make, take it the child is like more like either, you know, 17, 18, 20, 22 years old. Mm -hmm. um, in these patients that have GBS, you know, um, and patients with GBS, do you prefer that, you know, that these patients, uh, um, let's say they are, ambulatory also, um, you know, but having difficulties. I, I'm, do, do you think that these patients are better managed in the ICU given their propensity for dysautonomias and things like that? Do you think the first couple of days should always be spent in the ICU irrespective? Or do you th think that it's okay for these patients to actually go to the floor and be, you know, uh, treated there? I think the best thing is to err on the side of caution and monitor them for the first couple of days in the ICU. Yeah, and so and this question I'm, stable. yeah, this question I'm asking more for the sake of the adult, to for our adult residents and things like that, just to make them think about this issue a little bit more in terms of, uh, you know, what really, how sh you should look at these people and that uh, sometimes they can fool you, you know, and uh, and so, and you don't want to be, caught unawares. Um, so I think that that is something to be mindful, you know, of.
And I shared the link to this Erasmus um, tool for predicting decline. Um, you know, that's great, you know, and all, but um, I think one of the, you know, you know, we have forced vital capacity, NIFS in adults that, you know, they can cooperate with that. We don't have the luxury of that sometimes in smaller kids, but weakness of neck extension, I think is a, a really bad sign. So I think always remembering to check that, think about, you know, are they three days, four days in the course of their illness? When you think of the typical nadir of symptoms is like two weeks, then they have a high potential to clinically decline. So those factors, I think, at least for the first couple of days, I think they're safer in the ICU. Anybody else? I don't know if anybody has any anecdotes of their patients with demyelinating illnesses that, you know, sort of did something out of left field or some pearls that others may want to share about, you know, their experiences that have been sobering and given them some, you know, uh, pause for thought. And uh, um, and so, uh, you know, that may be very apropos to discuss that now, if people have some pearls they would like to discuss. I think, uh, Doc, I think Dr. Morgan uh, highlighted some of the more rare, um, severe, uh, uh, acute consequences of demyelination in the wrong place. Uh, I did take care of a, a kid who presented with acute um, respiratory decompensation, um, ultimately ending up with an MS diagnosis. And um, he, so he ended up getting diagnosed with a uh, neurogenic pulmonary edema um, that responded pretty well to steroids once it was identified. Um, we've taken care of a number of kids here who have uh, really a dramatic ADEM presentations who end up in the ICU. Um, there's been a number who have required decompressive craniotomies, um, who end up getting steroids, plasmapheresis, and sometimes um, chemotherapeutic agents. We've done cyclophosphamide uh, in a number of them. So I think your point that uh, when, when time is not on our side, then we just kind of throw the kitchen sink at them to shut things down quickly because they are at risk for pretty severe uh, decompensation. Mm -hmm. um, we also, you know, there's been a number of times when we've seen kids with myelitis who don't fit the, the clinical picture in the textbook uh, very well. We have to keep in mind that cord imaging is not perfect. And so sometimes if our um, exams or um, tests that we have available uh, in the hospital, point towards a cord problem, but we can't see it, we shouldn't throw that out. Um, and sometimes- right. and the other thing is, you know, if you're, you're thinking of like AFM and you're looking at, you know, was this like a fibrocartilage, you know, into your spinal infarct versus AFM, well, diffusion of the cord in a little kid, it's pretty hard because it's a small structure. So, um, that fact, I mean, that obviously makes the diagnosis difficult. So yeah. I think that uh, Michael's point about the cord imaging and not seeing something on the MRI and but not deviating from the path and, you know, doing that is very, very important point. And I'm glad he said that because it would be really, really a big error to see somebody that seems to look like they've got a acute cord lesion. Now, obviously, sometimes it is difficult to sort out whether the lesion is ischemic or whether it is inflammatory. If, you, um, if the process is ischemic or inflammatory sometimes, or if it doesn't show up on the MRI, 
Um, but I think in those patients, it should not detract from making a diagnosis of a myelopathy, myelitis, whatever the case may be, and treating those patients accordingly. Uh, it would be a big error to say you don't see something on an MRI and therefore you just like say, okay, well, the cord is fine. Well, that's not fine. I mean, I, I remember very well when I was by myself and uh, they were, you know, for a long period of time. I mean, I had several patients over those years that had negative imaging that I treated and I just had to use my pure clinical acumen in those cases. And I'm very glad I treated because those people turned out all to be, you know, patients with cord and long-term issues with bladder or things like that. So absolutely, uh, you have to be very aware of the shortcomings of imaging of the cord in these patients. And then the other interesting complication I'd like to point out with ADEM that can be a real acute one and can get the patient into trouble very quickly would be if you have a lesion that is sitting close to the fourth ventricle or thereabouts, you can develop a obstructive hydrocephalus. And we've had a couple of kids now in the last 25 years that actually have had obstructive hydrocephalus from an ADEM-like lesion. And actually, Anna Errett and uh, Gary Marshall published a very nice uh, article on that. And uh, and then Moriarty and I took care of a patient, uh, you know, with a uh, lesion uh, that was sitting at the a uh, fourth ventricle that caused hydrocephalus. And this girl came in for a shunt acutely and Moriarty looked at the lesion and looked at the MRI and said to me, you know, this doesn't look like a you know, tumor to me. And so we gave the patient steroids and the next morning the patient was better and uh, we saved the patient from uh, getting a uh, EVD or a shunt or what have you. So remember that acute hydrocephalus can be a complication of ADEM if it uh, causes a uh, lesion that causes obstructive hydrocephalus. So we've had a couple of those kids. And I, I do um, want to emphasize your point about si patients with signs of myelopathy on their exam with negative imaging. And uh, Mike's point too, um, you know, prior to the revision of the diagnostic criteria for NMO, I did have a patient who I treated who had optic neuritis, but at the time you had to have optic neuritis and first myelitis, which I had no objective proof of except the exam. So uh, the clinical exam is really um, paramount and um, we shouldn't be so reliant on imaging. I feel like a lot of um, the younger folks um, are very reliant on imaging, but sometimes there are circumstances where you really can't get that. It's not available on weekends, on holidays. Um, so you really have to rely. And sometimes, Beth, it can be as mild as a neurogenic bladder with some upgoing toes, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I remember this girl with Turner syndrome that I took care of, uh, whose findings were just, she had some very mild weakness in the legs along with, uh, you know, a neurogenic bladder and upgoing toes and ended up having mild uh, neurogenic bladder issues long term, but made a very nice recovery otherwise. And I suspected that she probably had a lesion in the conus that was not visualized on imaging. This was in the late 90s. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you guys so much and have a good day. Thank you, Beth, thanks very much.